Okay, hi everybody, thank you, hello. I hope uh, you're well. Chodesh Tov. Mishinich Nesadra Marben B'Simcha. When the month of Adar comes in, uh, we increase our Simcha, our spiritual Simcha. And uh, we all hope and pray that uh, this Adar should be a Zman of Geula, a Zman of Yeshua, uh, eventually leading to the Geula that will become Niskala, will become revealed in the month of Nisan. So part of the idea of Ador is it is the precursor to the month of Nisan. And Chazal tell us, Ben Nisan Nigalu, we were redeemed in Nisan, Uben Nisan Asid and Ligayel, and in Nisan will be the future uh, redemption. Uh, so today's shir uh, is an aliyat neshama uh, for the father of Chaya Feingold, David Moshe, David Moshe ben Avram Fischel, and the brother of Chaya Feingold, Yonatan Yisrael ben David Moshe. May the learning be an aliyat uh, nishmatam. A Rafua Shlema for Chaim Shlomo Mordechai ben Freidel and Sarah Chana Bashena. Whenever I see my wife's name, it always strikes me. Like, Gee, this is my wife's name. It is my wife. Baruch Hashem, uh, she's doing much better, but we, we might appreciate the Tfilas as well. For Sarah Chana Bashena. Uh, and in addition, uh, from Arik Davinsky, that he requested that uh, we, I say a bracha for his dad's yard site on the 6th of Ador. His name is Shlomo. Ben Habel, and I usually start drinking before, so I never have a chance to be Makayimit, but tonight indeed I will make a bracha that it should be Le'ili Nishmato. And uh, if I could just add, in my mother's uh, yard site, uh, Allah Shalom, is uh, this week. It's going to be Wednesday night and Thursday, so I personally would also like to uh, dedicate this year. <coughs> Le'ili uh, Nishmata, Chaya Esther, Bas Eliezer, Zichron Levracha. And finally, uh, the following special dedications by Rina and Mark Questel, the entire month of Adar. Thank you very much. In appreciation of uh, Rabbi Breitowitz and the Torah he shares, as a Zichus for a Fuah Shlema for Kol Chole Yisrael, and that Chodesh Adar should be filled with Simcha for all of Ami. So thank you and Amen. Kain Yehi Yehi Ratzon. We are entering a very large section of the Book of Shmos, and if you recall, we spoke a few weeks ago that the Ramban says there are three major themes in the Book of Shmos with a number of detours. There is Yitzias Mitzrayim, which is leaving impurity. There is Kabbalah Satora, which is getting a mission. But then we have the ultimate goal of everything. And that is to make a dwelling place for the divine presence in this lowly world. In the language of the Balatanya, to make a dira betachtainim. It is God's deepest desire in ways that we don't fully perceive. That his presence should be manifest specifically in this lowly earth, in this dark darkness, in this Hester Panim, in the concealment of the divine. And the Mishkan and later the Beis Hamikdash is the tangible uh, evidence, so to speak, of God's presence existing within us. And everyone knows the famous drasha of Chazal, V'yasuli mikdash, make for me a sanctuary, make for me a holy place, v'shachanti betocham, so I may dwell in their hearts and souls. It is not the building. The building is a symbol of something much more deeper and much more profound, the divine presence that exists within our heart, within our soul, the famous statement from the Sefer Charedim that's been put to music as well. Bilvavi Mishkan Evnech. I build a dwelling place for God in my heart, in my soul. In fact, uh, when the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed, so Nebuchad, the first Beis HaMikdash, Nebuchadnezzar was boasting that he destroyed the house of God. And God's response was, I don't live there anymore. You didn't destroy my house. I moved. And the concept is, I live there when Hashem is in the heart and soul of the Jewish people. When we are not worthy of Hashem being in our heart and soul, 
the apartment is vacant. So he told Nebuchadnezzar, or he said about Nebuchadnezzar, anybody could destroy it. It's just a building at that point. I'm not there. So when we read about these partios, we're recognizing that it's not just about a beautiful building. There are beautiful buildings. The Mishkan was beautiful. The Beis HaMikdash was more so. But there are beautiful buildings. I, I, mean, I, I can't tell you, maybe it's sacrilegious, if the Beis HaMikdash was more beautiful than the Taj Mahal. You know, I don't know. But that's, that's really besides the point. It wasn't the physical building. It was the presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's uh, Shekhinah. V'yasu li mikdash v'shachanti b'seichan. And that is why we still have a mitzvah of building a Beis HaMikdash today, even if the physical building of the Mikdash must await Mashiach, and that is the sheet of the Rambam. I'll talk a little bit about the halachic aspects of that a little later on. But the Svarim HaKadoshim tell us that we still have an obligation to build the Beis HaMikdash by creating a place in our heart for the Divine Presence. That is our Binyan Beis HaMikdash. And if enough of us do that, and there'll be a critical mass at some point. There will be the Beis HaMikdash coming down Min HaShemayim because we've reached a level where we are worthy of the Shachanti Besochan. Now as you read the Pasuk forward and backwards, I make me... I put my helmet on, yeah. I put my helmet on. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. Well, I tell you, um, I remember, uh, and actually somebody confirmed it, they sent me a YouTube uh, video. I remember being at the Kotel once, and um, maybe it's around 10 years ago, I don't know. And there was a, something that looked like a satellite all of a sudden that was coming down really, really, really fast. Going all the way down. And then it went straight up really, really fast. I don't know. It sounds to me like, you know, Hashem was bringing down the base of Mikdash and decided, nah, not ready yet. <laughs> it really had that, that, that sense. It was really a very amazing thing. So, you know, Bezra Hashem, next time it comes... Uh, we should be ready, so keep your helmet on. It's good. You're, you're a mitzapa. You believe in, in, the, in the return of the, of the base of, of the base HaMikdash. So I want to discuss a, a few issues here. First of all, there's a very, very interesting shita of Rashi. If you read the Chumash, essentially all of the commandments about building the Mishkan are, are while Moshe is at Mount Sinai for 40 days, right? The end of last week's Parsha said, Moshe enters the cloud, and Moshe is with Hashem for 40 days and 40 nights. That's the very end of last week's parsha. And so, and, and question. How is this belief of uh, the temple going down from heaven yeah. uh, raises something like 100 mitzvahs from the 600? I mean, how, how many mitzvahs are connected to the temple? To build the temple? Yeah. Well, there's a, well, well, there's a mitzvah to build the temple, and then uh, there are subdivisions about the different utensils, and then, of course, there are many commandments about korbano, so there are certainly over a hundred commandments connected with the temple and connected with the worship of the temple. So, building, yeah. no, no, the building, no, no, I, uh, technically, according to the Rambam, there's only one commandment uh, called building okay, the temple. This one. Yeah, that's the only one. But according to Rashi, uh, Rashi seems to say that uh, we don't have a mitzvah to build a temple. Hashem will bring down the temple. This is, this is uh, not uh, inside Rashi. Rashi in uh, Rosh Hashanah al is, is that's not correct. about that. It's about the spiritual... Uh, well, well, you, you know, you, you, okay, you want to give an explanation. All right, you can give an explanation. Uh, okay, you know, maybe, uh, maybe not. I mean... Fire. The I, I, I understand, but okay. Uh, we're not going to argue over what is the pshat of Rashi. Uh, okay, I mean, Rashi says the third mikdash comes down min uh, You're offering an interpretation. Okay, but say it. So, how can Rashi. Uh, well, first, first of all, uh, it doesn't say that every single detail will come down min It could be the basic uh, thing will come down, and we'll have a lot of things we have to do, meaning. Uh, it could be a partnership, it could be a collaboration. Hashem will, will do Mina Shemayim and we will have to do the finishing work and the like. So it's not, a, it's not a contradiction in that way. Now, Rashi says in Chumash, not in Rosh Hashanah, Rashi says a very, very interesting issue. Even though the mitzvah of Mishkan seems to be while Moshe is in the 40 days, which is before the golden calf, because the eagle is after Moshe comes down. 
Rashi says this is an amazing example of Ein Mukta Mamu'ukhar B'Torah. That means the Torah does not always follow chronological sequence. And Rashi says, in point of fact, Moshe was not given any commandment about the Mishkan till after the Chaydo Ego. And then Moshe Rabbeinu went up a second time. Actually, it was the third time because the second time he prayed. But when he went up the second time, Rosh Chodesh Elul, to get the second Luchos, and he came down on Yom Kippur, that is when Hashem gave him the commandment about the Mishkan. And that, of course, is when he communicated to us the day after Yom Kippur that we should build a Mishkan. Which means Rashi is saying a very startling proposition. Had there not been a Chayda Egel, had we gotten the first tablets, right? Moshe comes down with the first Luchos. Moshe gives us mitzvos, whatever mitzvos he gave us at the time. It would not have included the Mishkan. There would not have been a Mishkan had there not been a Chet HaEgel that necessitated Moshe Rabbeinu going up a second time. Again, it was the third time, but the second time to get the second Luchais. Now Rashi doesn't explain why. In fact, Rashi's proof is a very tenuous proof. The only proof Rashi gives is that Moshe did not command B'nai Yisrael about the Mishkan till he came down the second time. Well, that's fine. But that doesn't prove he didn't get the commandment from Hashem. And in fact, the Ramban says, Beferish, the Ramban says, there is no reason. Right, remember, the Ramban has, doesn't like the Klal. He, he can't dismiss it entirely because the Gemara says it. But Ramban does not like the rule of Ein Mukta Mamu'ukher Batora because the Ramban likes to make everything chronological. So the Ramban says, of course, Moshe got True meant it's Ava Moshe got the mitzvah of Mishkan and the mitzvah of Big Day Kahuna the first 40 days. But because of the Chet Egel, he didn't get around to communicating it to the Jewish people till he came down the second time. And you follow the Torah Kaseder. Truma and Tetzave, which is Mishkan and Big Day Kahuna, are before the, the commandment is before the Chet Egel. Then there's the Chet Egel, and then Moshe Rabbeinu has to go up and down and pray and go up a, a second time. And then, he, in Vayakal Pekude, he commands us after Yom Kippur. That's the Ramban Shita. But Rashi says no. Rashi says it's not just Moshe's command to Bnei Yisrael, that was after the Chayda Egel. It was the Etzem command by Hashem to Moshe. Now Rashi does not give us the logic of this. Like what is the Svora that uh, the Chayda Egel created Mishkan and there wouldn't have been a Mishkan without Chayda Egel. So there are different Svoras that Meforshim say and based on Chazals and sometimes based on separate Svoras. The first is a Svora of the Soporno, Ravavadja Soporno the great uh, Italian commentator of the Renaissance, who on his own comes to the same conclusion as Rashi, not because of Rashi. He also understands that the Mishkan is a response to the Chet Egel. He says the following. He says, on one hand, the Mishkan is a wonderful thing. It means God's presence is with us. On the other hand, it also represents a certain monument to spiritual failure. Because Mishkan means you approach God in a specific place, a specific location, with specific authorized people, Kohanim, you know, Levim, in a certain way through the ritual of Korbanos. In an ideal world of Kedusha, every single person would be like a Kohen. Every single place would be like a Beis HaMikdash. As Hashem says, B'chal Makom, Every place where my, I, I will cause my name to be mentioned. I will come to you. And I will bless you. So says the Soporno, in an ideal world, we wouldn't have needed to approach God in a specific place and a specific way. It is only because of the Chet Egel that even though Baruch Hashem, Hashem forgave us, there was atonement, but there was a certain distancing. We no longer have the ability to access the Shekhinah every single place and by every single person. And therefore, the Mishkan is actually, you might even call it, a monument to spiritual failure. This is how the Sopornos idea would fit into Rashi, that without the Chet Ego, there wouldn't have been a Mishkan. Now the question is, 
how far does that mean? I mean, does Rashi mean without the Chedegel there wouldn't have been a base of Mikdash? In other words, how far are you going to take it? Are you going to, well, who needs a base of Mikdash at that point? I, I don't know. But at least in the Midbar, perhaps, where the Hashra Sashchina was so obvious, the entire Machana would have had the holiness of the Mishkan. So that is the Soporno's understanding that we could bring into Rashi. There's a second understanding, and again, this is uh, from view of the Halevi and the Kuzri. Now, he was before Rashi, so obviously he's not explaining Rashi, but he's coming to his own conclusion. Review the Halevi, who also learns that Mishkan is a response to the, to the um, Chet Ego, And he says a very interesting idea. He says, you know, on one hand, the Torah is very against idolatry in all of its forms, over and over and over again, no idolatry, no images. And the Torah even says, remember, remember, remember on the day of Matan Torah, when Hashem revealed his presence, you saw no picture, you saw no image. Right? Hashem is very, very emphatic. And indeed, the Rambam took that almost as an obsession to kind of remove any semblance of a visualization of corporeality and the like. And that's why the Homer and the although he branches off into many, many things, but the Rambam himself writes, the purpose of the Mor and the was to explain the anthropomorphic expressions in Tanakh, like the hand of God, the eyes of God, etc., to, to, to be sure that people understand them not to be literal ideas. And yet, paradoxically, in the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the holiest of holiest places, you walk in, there's an ark, right? The Arun HaKodesh. And on top of the ark are statuettes, statues of, ch of angelic children, the Kruven. It's as if we have Avodah in our holiest place. What's going on? So the Kuzuri develops an idea that actually, although the Rambam happened not to like the Kuzuri as a safer, that's a, <laughs> that's a separate issue. But the Kuzuri develops an idea that the Rambam actually uses later, although I'm not sure he got it from the Kuzuri. And that is, he said, that when people have a need, and that need could take them into bad negative places, Hashem will find some way to incorporate that need within a framework that will avoid the negative consequences rather than compel that we go cold turkey because that would be against the nature that we have. And the Kuzari mentioned that part of the attraction of Avedisara, it's a complex phenomenon, was the notion of having a tangible way of connecting to God. A tangible, I need a visualization. I need some type of physical connection. In fact, some have said that that is the, was the power of Christianity in and of itself, in which God, on some aspect, got incorporated into a human form, a son of God, whatever the, the, idea, the idea is. That way I can connect, that way I can feel that, you know, I'm part of him, he's part of me. So that's why people, including the Jewish people in Mitzrayim, were aduk, attached to Avodah Zarah. Now, God doesn't want that because God is not a body, God is not a form. God wants to take us away from idolatrous rituals. But to simply abolish them totally would be against our nature. We were not ready for that tra type of transition. So, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us physical structures. Instead of simply saying, relate to me by meditation and prayer. Who needs physical buildings? Who needs sacrifices? God said, no, you need this. You have this urge for physicality. You have this urge for tangible avoda. I'll give it to you. And if you have this urge for avoda zara, I'll even give you idols in the Mishkan itself. But they have to be concealed. They have to be withdrawn. You know they're there. And that can be a focus of your prayer and devotion. So the Kuzari says, had there not been a chayda ego, had the Jewish people not needed that physical representation, we would have graduated to a higher level of spiritual worship. But the chayda ego was megala, precisely that idea, that we needed that physical intermediary system. So God says, I'll give it to you within the framework of the Mishkan and all of the rules. So you see, unlike the Soporno, who sees the Mishkan as signifying God distancing himself from us, the Kuzari looks at the Mishkan as God accommodating 
human weakness. God is accommodating. God, now the Gemara Chulin says this even by Kashras. We were talking about Kashras before. It mentions that God made a world where every non-kosher animal uh, has a corresponding kosher animal that tastes the same, except for one particular fish it says. You can only get in the tray variety. Uh, but everything has its parallel taste because God doesn't want to deprive you. If you like uh, shrimp, right? So that's why we have <laughs> fake shrimp or, or whatever, whatever it would be. There will always be a taste that will parallel the, the non-kosher kosher variety because Hashem wants to accommodate our weaknesses. Now, when I said that, I think the Rambam either borrowed the idea or came up with it. I mean, that's exactly what the Rambam says by Korbanos, that Korbanos were a concession to our idolatrous impulse. The Kuzari is extending it to the Mishkan and to the Kodesh Akdashim and to the Kruvin. Right, so that is uh, the second idea. So the idea number one is Mishkan represents distancing Idea number two, Mishkan represents accommodation. And then there's idea number three, which is the earliest source, a Medrash of Chazal, that Mishkan represents a tangible sign that Hashem has forgiven the Chet Egel, meaning to say that uh, after the Chet Egel, Hashem wanted to destroy us. Hashem wanted to abrogate the covenants. Hashem wanted to make a private deal with Moshe Rabbeinu which Moshe Rabbeinu turned down. He said, if you're not gonna, if you're gonna erase them, take me out of the book, etc." And eventually, Moshe's tefillahs and Klal Yisrael's tshuva were matzliach, and Hashem shows, I am with you by the Mishkan. Meaning, had there not been a Chedo Egel, he didn't have to show it in that particular way. But the Chedo Egel, I'm sorry, but the Mishkan is a sign of divine forgiveness. So these are three explanations of Shitas Rashi. Shitas Rashi is Mishkan is response to Chet HaEgel. That's all. Rashi doesn't say why. He just says that's how the chronology is understood. And this is an example of Ein, Muktam, Umu'uchar, Batora. But we have three possible reasons. This is porno because we're no longer Zoha to access God at all places. The Yerud levi it is a concession to our need for visualization. And the Medrash, it is a sign of divine reconciliation in the aftermath of the golden calf. But the Tzad HaShaveh, the common denominator of all three explanations is, without Ego, there wouldn't have been Mishkan. Quite amazing. And therefore, two whole partials. Remember, the Egel is in Parshas Kisisa. So, Truma Tisave, you actually rip it out and put it after the Chedo Egel. It's a very, you know, normally, Ein Mukti Mokhabatora might be a Pusuk or two. I mean, here, your mom is taking two whole Parshios, moving them uh, later on into the Torah. Now, all of this, just to be sure you, you understand the Shitas, all of this is only according to Rashi. According to Ramban, Mishkan is independent of Chedo that Moshe Rabbeinu got the commandments of Mishkan in the first 40 days. And it's not connected to the Chet Egel. It's a separate uh, area of Hashras Hashchina. Now, let me just, I, I don't want to get into the details of Halacha too much, uh, but let me, let me just point out that we really have two different Halachic mitzvos connected uh, with Mikdash. Number one, uh, Vyasuli Mikdash, the Rambam does say, is a positive commandment to build a house for God based on the instructions. Of course, if we would do it today, it wouldn't be the instructions of Mishkan, but it would be the instructions of Beis Amikdash, which are a different architectural plan. And then there's a sec separate, separate issue of bringing korbanos. Now, it's important to know halachically, the mitzvah of bringing korbanos and the mitzvah of building a Beis Amikdash are two separate mitzvahs. In point of fact, halachically, Bringing korbanos bezman hazeh does not even require a base mikdash, because according to the Rambam, the holiness of the makom hamikdash survived the korban. So even if we don't have a base hamikdash, the kedushat hamakom of the mikdash, the Rambam says, is still there, and therefore we could bring korbanos. Now you may ask a question: well, What do you mean you can bring korbanos? For since the Rambam maintains. The holiness of the Mikdash is there. That's why we can't even enter 
at least some areas of the Harabayas. Some areas might be permitted, but certainly there are areas of the Harabayas where the Mizbeach was and the Kodesh HaKdashim were not even allowed to enter because all of us are Tameh because of contact with a dead body and we're not purified because we don't have the ashes of Paraduma. So, how can you say, oh, we could bring Korbanos because it still has Kedusha? <laughs> if it has Kedusha, we're not even allowed to enter, which is why we don't enter. But the answer is no, that's actually not true. Because it is true that a person that's Tame is not allowed to enter those areas. But it's also true, there's another principle about Korbanos that's called Tuma Hutra Bitsibor. And that actually means the laws of impurity are suspended if one is in order to bring the communal offerings of the Beis HaMikdash. So Kohanim who are Tame would be allowed to bring the Korban Tamit. They would be allowed to bring the Musaf. They would light the menorah. They would bring the Ketoris. So yes, I'm not allowed to go in just to be a bystander. I'm not allowed to go in for a Tiyu because I'm Tame and that's a holy place. But the Avedas HaMikdash would be permitted even without a Binyan Beis HaMikdash because of Tumah Hutra B'tzibar. Now the truth of the matter is, this issue was raised around 250 years ago by Rav Tzvi Hirsch Kalasher, who was, it was, a, it was a big Talmud Chacham, he was a Mamesh, a, a Gadol B'Torah, but he was one of the first religious Zionists around the theater rehearsal time, and he was a visionary, he wrote a Sefer, Dirishat Zion, which is one of the first rabbinic books about uh, establishing a state and the like back in the 1850s or whatever. And one of his proposals was, hey, why don't we bring Korbanos? Putting aside the political issues of, of what that would, would mean. And he argued that halakhically we can bring Korbanos based on Tuma Hutra. So you couldn't bring your private sin offering because you're Tame, that, that's true. But communal offerings have the heter of Tuma Hutra B'tzibor. So he sent his uh, book to the Gedol Hador, Rabbi Kiva Eger, the Chassam Sofer, later Rabbi Yaakov Etlinger, uh, the Orach Lener, Rabbi Shemshin Rafael Hirsch's Rabbi. And as you would expect, um, virtually all of them, really all of them said, doesn't work. And I don't want to get into all the halachic reasoning, I just want to mention Rabbi Kiva Eger's idea. Rabbi Kiva Eger said, whether the Makam HaMikdash has holiness today or not, is really a machlokas, the Rambam and the Ravid. The Rambam says the Makam HaMikdash has Kedusha even today. But the Ravid says the Makam HaMikdash lost its Kedusha when there was a Chorban. Now Rabbi Kivegra points out each opinion has a leniency and a strictness. <coughs> According to the Ravid, if the Makam HaMikdash does not have sanctity today, you are 100% allowed to walk around the Makam HaMikdash. You can even enter the Holy of Holies. It doesn't have Kedusha today. That's the Ravid's leniency. But the Chumrah is, if it doesn't have Kedusha, you wouldn't be allowed to bring Korbanos. Bringing a Korban on the Harabayat would be like bringing a Korban in your backyard. So like the Ravid, the Kula is, I'm allowed to walk around. The Chumrah is, I'm not allowed to bring a Korban. Like the Rambam, it would factor exactly the opposite. Because the place has Kedusha, I wouldn't be allowed to just go in, because I'm Tameh. But, Tuma Hutra B'tzibor would allow Karbanas. So says Rabbi Kiva Eger, kind of simple, that since this is a great, great machlokas, and we don't have the power to decide between the Rambam and the Ravid, we have to be Machmir, according to both positions, even though it's inconsistent. We're machmir like the Rambam, that we don't enter. Again, I'm not dealing with the outer shtochim, that's another, but we don't enter the inner part of the Harabayat, because maybe the halacha is like the Rambam, but we don't bring korbanos, because maybe the halacha is like the Ravid. Which is actually a very fascinating point, because essentially Rabbi Kivega is conceding that according to the Rambam, you would be able to bring korbanos, but we have to be choshesh for the shita of the, of the Ravid. This is what Rabbi Kivega said. Uh, when uh, the Beis HaMikdash is rebuilt. You would have to rebuild the Beis HaMikdash. Now, so that brings us to the second question. Okay, that's about Korbanos. 
No, the building of the Beis HaMikdash, the building of the Beis HaMikdash itself, because once the Kedusha has lapsed, you need a Binyan. Now, so the question then becomes, okay, what about the mitzvah of building the Beis HaMikdash? Like, what stops us from building the Beis HaMikdash? Well, first of all, th there are some problems here, because... Uh, Tuma Hutra B'tzibor only applies to Karbanos. In other words, in other words, if we are Tomei and we can't enter the area, if we are Tomei, then even though we're doing it for the purpose of Karbanos, the law of Tuma Hutra B'tzibor does not apply to Binyan. Right? So we would have to wait till we have Paraduma. That, that's, that's one issue. Uh, the other issue is the Rambam has a Psak. And then the question is, what's the mucker of the Rambam? The Rambam clearly says that Binyan Beis Hamikdash is a messianic task. That one of the roles of Mashiach is to be Bona the Beis HaMikdash, implying that until there's a revelation of Mashiach, uh, we don't do that mitzvah. Now, that's a Shver Rambam, actually. It is Shver. It's a difficult Rambam. Because where do you ever find that a mitzvah is suspended or not activated until Mashiach comes? And indeed, there is a Talmud Yerushalmi that says the opposite. The Talmud Yerushalmi says, what was that line in that movie? Build it and they shall come? Mm. Right, famous, uh, whatever. Uh, the Yerushalmi says it exactly about the Beis HaMikdash. Build it and he shall come. Meaning, Binyan Beis HaMikdash brings Mashiach. Field yeah, that's Field of Dreams, that's right. But this is, build the Beis HaMikdash and Mashiach will come. So, the Rambam does not paskin like that, you show me. The Rambam paskins that Binyan Beis Hamikdash is totally on Mashiach. But what is the characteristic? Say again? Yeah. What qualifies the Mashiach? Okay, so that's a whole, uh, yeah, that's a whole, uh, okay, yeah, that's a whole discussion, huh? The, 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 the Mashiach is at least a king or a leader. Yeah. It, it wouldn't be come upon each and every one of us to... No, that's correct. We have to have someone who says he's Mashiach and meet, meets, meets the criteria, meets the criteria, which again, maybe we'll give a separate share on that uh, someday. The person who builds the is the Mashiach. Well, the Rambam says the following. The Rambam says there are two levels in Mashiach's revelation. The first is he brings the Jews back to Eretz Yisrael uh, and he is like a melech. And at that point, he is what's called Cheskas Mashiach. We assume he's Mashiach. Once he meets the standard of Cheskas Mashiach, he then has the right to try to rebuild the Beis HaMikdash. If he is successful, we now know he's Mashiach. If he's not successful, we know he's not Mashiach. But the point is, you don't listen to him until he qualifies as Cheskas Mashiach. Well, uh, again, if you remember uh, in the book of Ezra, which was the building of the second Beis HaMikdash, so there was a non-Jewish population that wanted to participate uh, either financially or actually by building uh, the Mikdash, and they said, no, we don't want, we don't want you to be involved. They, 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 they could do it, but you see that it, it's not, it was not a proper, it was not a proper thing to do. Um, and uh, it's recorded in Tanakh that way, so Ms. Tama, we would not do the mitzvah that I think. Okay, so again, um, you know, different people have different political shittas about this. I don't want to get into to, to all of the politics, but uh, at least with respect to Yidin, uh, as I say, it, it is very, very clear that Tuma Hutra B'tzibor uh, would not be a mater for Binyan Beis HaMikdash. Okay. Uh, but the halachic, halachic aspects are very interesting. And by the way, by the way, uh, even though we're machmir, that Jews cannot bring korbanos today, B'nai Noach actually could, and B'nai Noach are allowed to bring korbanos even on bamot, on private altars. So a Ben Noach, a guy, could bring a korban in his backyard. Uh, that would be mutter. Not only in Eretz Yisrael, even in Chutz Laaretz. So, I understand that some rabbis who are involved in the Ben Noach movement have been talking about encouraging non-Jews to bring korbanos. Others think that's a terribly uh, bad idea uh, because number one, it'll confuse a lot of Jews who think they could do the same thing, which they could not. And number two, whatever korbanos beklal uh, are very, very controversial uh, in this in this day and age. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But now I, I want to share with you a, a very interesting ha'ara of the Or HaChayim HaKadosh. Moshe Rabbeinu is told that he should take from the Jewish people 
all sorts of donations. This didn't happen until Yom, after Yom Kippur, but, but still uh, the commandment is given in Truma. And it seems to enumerate them in descending order, going down. Zohav, gold, silver, copper, techeles, going down, 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 down. And it ends, however, with Avne Miluim, the precious jewels on the Kohen Gadol's breastplate. So the Archaim asks that certainly at least some of the Avne Miluim were much more precious even than gold. So if the Torah is going from the highest to the lowest, why does it end with the Avne Miluim that are the most precious? Right, that's the Archaim's Kasha. So the Archaim gives three answers. Answer number one is, it is true that the Avni Miluim, at least some of them, diamond, you know, ruby, emerald, were the most precious, but they were used for big day kahuna. They were used for the priestly garments. They were not used in the Mishkan itself. And since the Mishkan itself is more holy than the big day kahuna, so the Avni Miluim are mentioned last because they were actually not part of the Mishkan, they were part of the big day kahuna. Right, that's a technical answer. That is answer number one. But then he gives an answer number two. It says in Parshas Pikude that the Avni Miluim were actually donated. It's the only thing that were given the actual people who donated it. Donated by the Nisim, the heads of the tribes came up with this donation for the jewels. And Chazal described that the way it worked was they waited to see what everybody else gave and they said, we'll make up whatever was not yet given. The Avni Milum weren't given yet, so the Nisim were mashlim the chisara. So what's wrong with that? So says the Arachayim, that is a little bit of a chisara in the spontaneous generosity of one who wants to give. When you want to do chesed, you don't wait to see, or tzedakah, or hachzakas Torah, or building a Beis HaMikdash, or a shul. You don't necessarily wait to see what everybody else does. Number one, that may smack of a little of competition. Oh, you gave, I'm going to give you something better. And number two, in a sense, if you have a genuine desire in your heart, you almost can't contain yourself. If you have to wait till everybody gave, that's a chisaron in what is called nedivas halev. Right? The Torah describes donating to the Mishkan, kol asher yidvenu libay. Anyone whose heart wants to be generous. A nediv lev doesn't wait and be reactive. A nediv lev is proactive. And therefore, even though we didn't yet know, Moshe didn't know, that the Nesim would give, but when Hashem gives him the list, Hashem puts it last, knowing that the Nesim are going to be the ones that are going to wait and give it last. And that's a chisaron in Nedivos Halev. That is the second teretz of the Orachayim. And then the Orachayim gives a third teretz that's very interesting. There's a medrash that says, when it says the Nesim gave, the word Nesim has a double meaning. Nisim means heads of tribes, but Nisim in Biblical Hebrew also means clouds. Anonim are described as Nisim. In Mishlei, there are a number of psukim that talk about the Nisim bringing the rain. And the Medrash explains this double meaning, that every day the Jewish people got man, and the man came down in a cloud, and Hashem gave the Nisim these jewels, as a gift, right? Nesim, Nesim. The Nesim got the Avne Miluim through the Nesim, through the clouds that brought them their money. So here's what the Arachayim says. Every Jew that gave gold, silver, copper, this is what they got when they left Mitzrayim, or this is what they got at the Yamsuf. This represented compensation for their labor, for their work, for their suffering. Right, everything they'd cook, whether, whether when they left Mitzrayim or when they got it in the Yamsuf. So this came, so what they gave represented struggle and suffering. The Nisim got this as a freebie. Easy come, easy go. 
And Hashem is machshif. Those who donate that which caused, caused them to struggle and suffer, as Pirkei Avo says, lefum tsara, agra, according to the suffering, is the reward. We know, for example, that the Ani, who may give five dollars to a tzedakah, that may be much more valuable in the eyes of Hashem than a very wealthy person who gives a thousand dollars. Right, Bill Gates gives, I mean, Bill Gates gives more than a thousand dollars, but Bill Gates gives me a thousand dollars, what do they say? Uh, they say that, um, talk about the Shiras, if Bill Gates would uh, drop a thousand dollars on the floor, it would not be economically worth his time to pick it up because the time that it takes to bend over and pick it up, he, would have, he could have made much more money doing whatever it was he was doing. So let the thousand dollars go. So Hashem looks at the sacrifice. Hashem looks at the struggle. And the gold and the silver and the techelet that the Jewish people gave as a result of their sacrifice and their suffering is much more beloved to God than that that came as a freebie. Right? So these are three answers of the or HaChayim HaKadosh, why we mention the Avnei Miluim at the end of the list, although they were the most valuable. But now I want to go backwards a little bit. There is a famous, famous word, I'm sure you, you've heard it before, that when Hashem commands Moshe to collect from B'nai Yisrael all of these donations, so it says, Daber al B'nai Yisrael, speak to B'nai Yisrael, truma, they should take for me an offering. So people ask the Kasha, Moshe is asking them to give. Moshe might be taking. Hashem should have said, you should take. But I'm speaking to you to donate to the Mishkan. So why would I use to say, take for me a truma? It shouldn't say, vayikhuli truma. It should say, vayitnu li truma. So the Beis Levi says, a very, very well-known Yisait, beautiful Yisait, that a person should feel that that which they give for holiness, that which they give for chesed, that which they give for tzedakah, they're not really giving, they're taking. They're getting much more than they're giving. They shouldn't feel that they're sacrificing. Yeah, they're giving something up, but they're getting so much more then they're giving up. This idea that when you give, you really take. Um, in fact, it reminds me a little bit of a story. The story is only peripherally related. Um, a uh, bachar in Panovich, many years ago, was engaged to a, a young woman, and he took his kala to meet Rav Shach. And uh, Rav Shach spoke to the kala for a few minutes, and the kala said, my only goal in life is that my husband should learn I am willing to make every sacrifice. I'm willing to live on the floor. I'm willing to live on bread and water. I'm willing, you know, to, to, be, to not have a house, live outside. Anything. I will sacrifice. I will suffer. I will struggle. No matter what. Sounds good. So the story goes, this might be a story, I don't know if it's true, that when the shach talked to the bacher privately, he said, break off the shidduch immediately. <laughs> What's the shidduch? Because if her attitude is that this is suffering, this is struggling, I'm going to be a martyr, but I'm going to do it, that's not sustainable. That's not going to last. Eventually people crack and they become embittered. It should be the other way. It shouldn't be, I will suffer for this. It should be, who's suffering? This is the purpose of life, right? So if Shach said, you have to have a positive attitude. Like Rav Moshe Feinstein once said, again, with a little hyperbole, that the old Yiddish saying, it's hard to be a Jew. He felt destroyed a whole generation of Jews in America. This is the famous lost generation between World War I and World War II, right? You had, before World War I, you had the, the Russian and Polish Jews who came, most of them were from, but they were living in poverty, but they were religious, and uh, most of their children totally left Yiddishkeit. That's kind of a lost generation. After World War II, I mean, we still have, unfortunately, we still have so many Jews that are lost, but after World War II was the building of day schools, the building of yeshivas, so 
things became much more stronger. But between World War I and World War II, the generation of Jewish kids that were born in those years, there were some, again, some exceptions, some very great exceptions, but most of them totally left Yiddishkeit, even though their parents were from. And Rav Moshe said, because the parents were conveying the idea that Judaism is so hard, and indeed it was, you know, the idea of not finding a job. If you didn't work, go to work on Saturday, you had to find a new job on, on, on Monday. And the poverty and the discrimination and the kids are growing up in a land of freedom and they see what their parents are going through. So they leave it. But Rav Moshe said, if they would have absorbed the idea of the simcha of Judaism, the simcha of Torah, that you're getting more than you're giving up, they would have had a different perspective. And that's how important it is that we have to communicate to our children. Of course, we can only communicate it to our children if we feel that way ourselves. That's kind of the trick here. That the joy of Torah, the goodness of Torah. And that goes back to this Pasuk, the Beis HaLevi's thought. What you give is what you take. So they tell a story, and again, some of these stories, I, I don't know if they're true. Uh, that there was a Gevir, a rich guy, who was from in Europe, but he didn't give any stucca. He didn't want to give anything uh, to causes or whatever. So all the Russia yeshivas never got a cent out of him. But they say the altar of Navardic, the old man of Navardic, Rev. Yosef Yezel Harvitz, who was a very extreme person, he, was, he locked himself up in a house for two years, the hermit, whatever, and he, then he started a hundred yeshivas. Altar of Navardic was a very, very extreme person, and the altar of Navardic was able to get money from him. So, the Rosh Hashivas asked the altar of Navardic, what's your secret? We can't get a kopik out of him. So he says, I'll tell you the difference between you and me. He says, you respect his wealth. You walk into his mansion. You wipe your shoes of the mud. Uh, you carefully hold your coat. You don't throw your coat on the, on the couch. You convey to him, your wealth is great. Your wealth is important. You then ask him to give it up. People don't like to give things up. You're telling me to give up this wealth? He says, I am different, he says. I have no respect for his wealth. I track mud into his uh, li uh, living room. I put my feet on his uh, table. I convey to him, you have nothing at all here. But I got a deal for you. I'm going to give you a way in which you can turn this worthless wealth into something really great. So I don't ask you to give. I'm offering to give you something. He says, oh. So people may not want to give, but they're certainly happy to take. So the difference is, I come with the attitude that I'm giving you something. You come with the attitude that you're asking him to give you something. Again, in truth, had this story been said about any other gadol, I, I, I probably would not have believed it at all. With the altar of Navardic, it's shayach. It's possible. Although I, I'm not sure I believe it either, but... It's in the realm of possibility, knowing that the Altar of the was tended to be very, very extreme uh, in many, many uh, matters. In fact, uh, his whole thing was um, a person should never ask if something is possible to be done or not. They should just ask, is it needed? If it's needed, you start doing it even if you think it's impossible. That's not your cheshpin. It is only Hashem's cheshpin. You have to decide what is good and what is needed. You make no cheshmin at all if it's possible or impossible. And indeed, he established over a hundred yeshivas that survived uh, during Stalinist Russia. The Holocaust ended many things, but uh, uh, Navardic and Chabad were the, 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 the only two things that continued to operate in a large scale uh, in the darkness of the years of Stalin. It just they had, un they had amazing courage. So, because he recognized, just to mention one, one, one particular peculiarity, because he recognized that often people get inhibited by embarrassment or fear of failure, he had special exercises to teach his students not to be embarrassed. So he would make them go into a grocery store and ask for nails, or go into a tailor and ask for milk. So what happens? I go to a tailor and I say, uh, can you show me the milk? So the tailor says, are you crazy? This is a tailor shop. 
So you get used to being called crazy. Now, you may say, well, why is that good? He says, that is good. Because when you have to carry things out and people call you crazy, it's not going to bother you so much. You're used to that idea. He wanted to be margal them, not to be embarrassed. Because that could then be used in very positive ways. Now, suffice it to say that there were many gedolim who thought this was crazy. And they thought there was a chilol Hashem and the like. So I'm not getting into it. But, but you see, the altar of Navardic was a very, very extreme person in this way. And he was able to accomplish amazing, amazing things because of it. By the way, he was, um, his um, daughter married Rev. Rafael Shmulevitz, who was the father of Rav Chaim Shmulevitz, so the great Rav Chaim Shmulevitz. Rav Shiva of a mainstream Mir Yeshiva was the grandson of the altar of, of Navardic. So um, it got kind of modified in Rav Chaim, but Rav Chaim also had some of that tremendous passion that the altar of Navardic had. Okay. Um, so finally, I just want to, want to end with uh, a story about the Panavichirov, that part of building a Mishkan requires collaboration. It requires achtus. It requires that we all do it together. One of the meanings of the half shekel, right, why is the donation a half shekel, not a whole shekel? Because a half is incomplete unless you connect it to another half. And therefore, part of the Mishkan's message is the inner interdependence that all of us need. So here I just want to, again, share with you just different stories. A beautiful, beautiful story about the Panevich Rav. The Panevich Rav, Rav Shlomo, Yosef Kahaneman, was quite an amazing person. Uh, he was Nifter, I think, in 1968. And I still remember this. In 1968, I'm giving away my age, I was a ninth grader in Ner Yisrael. And I had just gotten to the yeshiva a few months before. And uh, the whole yeshiva gets assembled because Rav Ruderman, my Rosh Yeshiva, who knew the Panevich Rav, was a friend of the Panevich Rav, was going to give a eulogy. And it was all in Yiddish. I, I didn't really know what was going on. And I was sitting there and I was, I was you know, falling asleep. And I was a Yiddish, a Yiddish hesped. And all of a sudden I saw something that I have never seen before and I have never seen since. That all of a sudden he said, all of us have to sit on the ground. I had never seen that. I have never seen that little lie that he said, we have to get off our seats. We have to sit on the ground to be misabel over the Panevich Rav. Now the Panevich Rav was the Rav of Panevich, which was in Lithuania. And Lithuania had 800 Rabbanim, a community, community Rabbanim. 799 of them were murdered by the Nazis. He literally was the only Litvish Rav of a Kehila. I mean, there were other Rabbanim, but of a Kehila. He was the only Litvish Rav of a Kehila that survived the Holocaust. And as a result, he was obsessed with the idea of why did God give me life? And he knew he had a mission. His mission was to rebuild Torah in many, 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 many ways. The Panevich Yeshiva was one thing, but Panevich Yeshiva was not the only one that he did. He did many yeshivas, he did hospitals, he did orphanages. Uh, he did soup kitchens, he did stucca mostos, base yakovs, girls' schools, kindergartens, elementary schools. One of the great, great builders of Torah. And as a result, he spent a lot of his time traveling all over the world. And he once said that his biggest sacrifice for Klal Yisrael are all of the svarim that he could have written. But he gave it up because he said this was his mission in life. The Satma Rebbe once said, uh, back in 1968, I think it was shortly before the Panevich Rav died, when they had the moon uh, launching. So people were discussing, could there be intelligent life on other planets? The moon, Mars. So the Satma Rebbe said, Ich bin nicht a scientist, I'm not a scientist, but I know for sure there is no intelligent life on other planets because if there would be intelligent life on other planets, the Panevich Rav would be raising money there. <laughs> and if he didn't get to Mars, there's nothing there. That's what he said. <laughs> Satmar Rebbe said it. So the Panevich Rav um, was an unusual personality because he was a Gadol Batora, but he's also warm and kind and, and 
funny and had a wealth of stories from so many levels of experience. So every person could talk to him. You could be a great Rosh Hashiva and you could talk to him in learning. And you could be a simple person and he would joke, to joke with you about different things that were going on. Kind of a man of the people. Because of that, he happened to be very successful in fundraising because he was able to connect to everybody. So the story goes that uh, one day he came to Chicago. And in those days, uh, the before jets, to fly from Eretz Israel to Chicago, uh, even if there was a direct flight, I don't know if there was, would be something like 25 hours or 30 hours. It would be a really, really long schlep, much, much slower than today. And he, he came every year, and he got a lot of money. And one time when he came, a mashulach from a Navardika yeshiva in Bnei Brak came at the same time who would also make his trip, and of course he only made a fraction of what the Panevich Rav made. And when he saw the Panevich Rav walk in, the same day that he walked in, he turned white because he realized this isn't going to be a good day for me because the Panevich Rav is going to get everything, I'm going to get nothing. But then he figured, okay, listen, so today I'm not going to collect money, today I'm going to sit, I'm going to listen, I'm going to be inspired, I'm going to hear Tyra, I'm going to hear jokes, I'm going to remind him. So he just resolved, I'm going to be a spectator and learn from a gadol. So he sits. And the Panevich Rav, Kedarko Bakaydash, tells stories and tells jokes and tells Torah and tells Musar and inspires and is machazek people. And people are pulling out their checkbooks and they're going to write everything. And at the end of the speech, the Panevich Rav says, Rabosai, it's such an honor to talk to you. It's so geschmack. But I just want to tell you, there's a very chash of a yid from Bnei Brak, who also has a wonderful, wonderful yeshiva. And I just ask you that whatever you are going to give me, please give it to him, because this is also something that's very, very important and valuable. So suffice it to say that the Navardic Meshulach did much better than he ever did. He really got much, much more than he ever did. So he went over to the Pundit Vichirup and he said, you know, Rebbe, I'm so, so grateful. But I don't get it. You took a 30-hour trip to get to Chicago. Uh, and you're not young. Padivitro was already uh, old. The trip was not easy for him. And you just gave away all of the money? So the Padivitro said, I don't know what you mean. Give it away. You and I, I'm using more modern language, we're on the same team. He says, if this is enough money, so let's say 20 people could learn for a week. He says, why do I care? If the 20 people are in the Panovich based Medrash or the 20 people on the Novartic based Medrash. The point is, this is for Torah learning. This is for God's work. There's no me and I here. It's all for Hashem. Now, this is an extremely rare attitude, even among Rosh Hashivas, because everybody has a certain proprietary interest in the particular thing that they're establishing. But he didn't. He said, all that matters is that this goes for Torah, this goes for Kiddush Hashem, this goes for good things. I don't care if it's me or it's you. We're on the same team. We're not competing with each other in that way. And that's, again, that is emblematic of the notion of interdependence of the Machsa Sasheka. We all need each other. We got to work together. Now, there, there is actually a more modern day counterpart from Nelson Svi Finkel of Mir. Exactly the same way. Uh, you know, he had Parkinson's for many, many years, but he continued to travel. And tremendously great courage in doing this. And he would collect money, and then he'd speak in Baltimore, he'd speak in Lakewood, he'd speak to an Avreich, in Lakewood, he would give them the money. He said, oh, you need it. So as a result, I understand that uh, Mir made a, made him always go with somebody who took the money, meaning someone gave the money. <laughs> it, it, it went into the hands of the representative to be sure that it wasn't diverted. But his own shita was, it's not my yeshiva, it's Hashem's Torah. And that's the only thing we should care about. And uh, that's a wonderful thing, the idea that um, we don't have a proprietary interest that it got to be me in any way. The main thing is that God's name be elevated, God's name be 
be sanctified. So again, I want to wish everybody a, a Chodesh Tov, and uh, especially Mishinich Nasadar, Marbim, Marbim B'Simcha. Yeah.